Hi everyone and welcome to worship on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost and hopefully a wonderful Labor Day weekend um, for you and some rest for all those who labor. Um, take a moment this weekend, I hope you will, to give a big thank you and say a prayer for all of those people who are out there working every day. And just as information, uh, next Sunday on September 11th um, at St. James at 1030, we will be recognizing our first responders during the service. And at St. Paul at nine o'clock, we'll be having an outdoor service, weather permitting, um, including a blessing of backpacks for kids. And uh, later that night, we'll be kicking off another year of confirmation. And that starts at six o'clock in the evening. And that's gonna be an orientation for both parents and their students. Um, you are welcome to help spread the word of each of those events at uh, each of our churches. So that is next Sunday. Well, I really do wish you a week that is filled with love and healing and hope, all found through our Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul was in prison, he was aided by Onesimus a man who had run away from Philemon, a slave owner and a Christian friend of Paul. Paul told Onesimus to return to Philemon and encouraged Philemon to receive Onesimus back as a Christian brother. The sermon text for today is from the second reading, and that is from the book of Philemon, verses 1 to 21. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the, the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. And for this reason, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary, not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever. No longer a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Here ends the reading. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, there was a Baptist pastor in Louis Louisville, Kentucky, who said there was a college freshman who went to a Christian college 
and the young man was attending his first prayer meeting in the dorm where he lived. And surprise, he was called on to pray a sentence prayer. Not even that long, but it really made him feel nervous. And because he felt that kind of pressure, words didn't quite come out the way he meant them. He said, and Lord, make us more thankful for our blessings. Thankful rather than thankful. I mean, yet he had no idea just how appropriate that prayer was. Because our English word thank comes from an Anglo-Saxon root that means think. The two kind of go hand in hand. If we put on our thinking caps, for example, how much more thankful might we be? Thinking and thanking are the core of the lesson that I want to focus on today, and that is the second lesson from Philemon. We only read the book of Philemon during worship um, every three years, even though I think it's an absolutely amazing lesson. I'd encourage you to go back to your Bibles and reread it and even add the final four verses, which I didn't read today. Well, I think it's an amazing lesson because Paul himself is asking his friend Philemon to set his slave free. Uh, this is somewhere between the years of 54 to 62, well after Christ's death and resurrection and ascension. And it was a, during a time when many Roman people owned slaves, or they had indentured servants. But Philemon is different because now he is a Christian. It is thought that Philemon was saved and baptized through Paul's ministry in Ephesus. And so it wasn't all that far from where he lived in or near Colossae, along with his wife, Appia, and um, his son, Archippus. Well, Philemon is, in fact, now a leader of those Christians where they live. So his actions serve actually as a model for everybody to see. And it's there where, we, where he receives this very surprising letter from his friend Paul. And I would say that Paul was even serving as a mentor. Well, we know that Paul was at least partially responsible for Philemon's conversion to Christ. And through his writing, it's clear that Paul sees Philemon as owing him a favor. But he asked this favor to be transferred over to the slave Onesimus. Paul's now in prison, where he meets the slave named Onesimus, who happens to be owned by his friend Philemon. I mean, what a small world that was, right? And maybe he was a runaway, we're really not sure. But whatever it is that happened, Onesimus did not want to go back home. Now, if he was a runaway returned home, he most likely would have been punished severely. That was common in the day. Or even in some cases, executed as an example to other slaves. I mean, so this is a huge deal. And remarkably, Paul writes his letter on the slave's behalf. It's very personal, too. You know, normally Paul would be dictating his letters to a, a scribe, um, but because of the sensitive nature of the letter, he writes it himself. He starts his letter by saying all kinds of nice things. He thanks his friend for his faithfulness toward Christ and for his caring for all the Christians under his care. In other words, he starts to flatter him. You know, I give thanks to you and for you, Philemon which he probably did mean. But then he starts to appeal to him. And he um, appeals to him to welcome back his slave, even though he's a runaway, and to do so with open arms. He says, in effect, now, now just think about this for a second. There are so many ways that Onesimus is already useful to me and the cause of the gospel. And by the way, he's like a son to me. If your friend, if your leader, your mentor wrote that, wouldn't it get right to your heart? And Paul is, during this letter, I think, so unusually diplomatic. 
I mean, he's not really, he uses the word command there, but he's not actually commanding Philemon to do what he says. Instead, he's really persuading him. And he starts to do that by appealing to him and giving him a long reason, a long list of reasons for why it's such a beneficial thing to do. What's he going to get out of it? And the fact that it is the Christian thing to do. It's so unique among all of his other letters. I mean, Paul even offers to foot the bill for any outstanding bills or, or loss of the benefits um, relating to Onesimus. I want you to welcome Onesimus back in the way that fits the gospel. That's why we're doing it this way here. Think of him as a brother. I mean, think about the radical level of these words from Paul. Think about him as a brother, as I am your brother, equal in the eyes of Christ, no longer owned by anyone but Christ, just as I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ, owned only by Jesus himself. Now, I don't know if it took courage for Paul to write a letter like this. If you read uh, his other letters, um, he certainly had no problem at all giving instructions, commands, making demands on any other Christians in the churches he found he founded. Um, he's usually really blunt. But here, I think he took great care, special care, and did that in order to convince Philemon that this is the kind of action that a Christian should take. He's putting great thinking behind the thinking that he offers in this level letter. We should be willing always to forgive others, if only because Christ forgave us. Think about that. We should be willing to forgive others, if only because Christ forgave us. That alone should be enough of a reason for Philemon to forgive Onesimus for whatever he had done. You know, we have a lot of opportunities every day and every week to forgive others, to resolve our issues, to thank others, and also to think about how we can put our Christian faith into action through every letter or card that we write, every tweet that we send, every text, email, or phone call that we make. We're actually in a similar circumstance to Philemon in that he was in a position to show others what it means to be a Christian. And so we are at work. We show how we are a Christian within our families, among friends, and we do that for sure whenever we run into anybody outside of the church, especially then do we become models of being followers of Christ. There was a pastor who had an interesting experience when he grew up. And he said, you know, I remember when I was a child, um, there were these two older ladies and they were members of the church that I attended and they absolutely despised each other. For what reason, I never knew. And I suspect that a reason, whatever it was, they had even long forgotten. And yet each one attended every worship service of the church. They'd sit on opposite sides of the sanctuary, never speaking, never ever acknowledging each other's existence, even at fellowship times. <laughs> And I can remember, even now at prayer meetings, how absolutely absurd it seemed like to me, a 10-year-old boy, to hear those two ladies singing loudly, Oh, how I love Jesus. I mean, even as a 10-year-old boy, this pastor, future pastor, was able to see the phoniness, the hypocrisy, between those two sisters in Christ. You know, if we return to the root of giving thanks and we add the thinking part first, then that kind of separation is not supposed to happen. 
Forgiveness instead is supposed to happen. Loving, caring is supposed to guide our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. All based on Christ's own actions of dying on the cross for us. How might forgiveness and thanking look like in our ordinary week? I mean, start making your list just like Paul did, basically. Thanking others, just like Philemon, for their faithfulness towards Christ. That's a great place to start. Write your letter or make your phone call or take one action that might bring freedom to another person within, let's say, a difficult day. That's also what Paul did for Onesimus. When our motivation is in Christ, our thinking, our thinking, and our actions will automatically be based in forgiveness and love. Amen.